The 2,000-year romp of the Roman Empire across the world saw advances in law, engineering, and more, but some pretty horrific things happened under Roman rule, and it might surprise you just how horrific they actually were. No empire can subsist on benevolence. That's one of history's most awful truths. Each of the greatest civilizations to spread across the earth, the Romans included, did so at the expense of the territories it conquered. Rome's method of conquest was what the World Heritage Encyclopedia describes as Robert Shafter kleptocracy. Otherwise known as a plunder economy, the aim of this form of colonialism is to control and acquire the resources of conquered territories for the benefit to the empire. Essentially, you kill, you dominate, and then you steal everything that isn't nailed down, and that's where all your country's money comes from. This means Rome's territories received little to no support from the empire itself while they were robbed blind for the good of their occupiers. And while Rome certainly wasn't the last civilization to employ this MO, it was one of the first. Thanks to Christianity, the practice of crucifixion is today one of the world's most notorious forms of execution. Crucifixion was considered one of the most brutal and shameful modes of death in the ancient world. While the Romans didn't invent the method, that honor goes to the Assyrians and Babylonians, they nonetheless took it upon themselves to spend 500 years perfecting it. By the first century AD, the Romans were crucifying victims in packed arenas for sport. Roman citizens were exempt from the punishment, but anyone else, be they slaves, Christians, or foreigners, could be nailed up on a cross and left to die. The victim's death would come from a combination of blood loss, slow asphyxia, and oxygen deficiency in the blood. Because Roman guards were only permitted to leave the site of execution after the victim died, however, they'd often speed up the process by stabbing, beating, or burning the condemned before the cross could do its job. So yeah, perfected. Decimation was a vicious and bizarre punishment concocted by the legions of Rome to punish units which mutinied, fled during battle, or underperformed on the battlefield. Those who stand before me turned from field of battle, retreated. The word literally means removal of a tenth, and from that you can probably gather what went down. It happened like this. The offending group of soldiers would be divided into teams of ten men. A lottery would then take place in which one of the men would be chosen at random. The other nine would then beat that man to death, regardless of his rank, reputation, or even the part he played in whatever went down in the first place. The remaining soldiers would then be forced to make camp far away from the full army, where they were required to subsist for days on a diet of raw barley. Because of its effect on morale, decimation was rarely implemented as a punishment, but it wasn't unheard of. The most egregious instance occurred during the 3rd century when Emperor Maximian ordered the decimation of the Theban legion for refusing to renounce Christianity. After the decimation had been carried out, they again refused the order and were decimated again. Eventually, the entire legion was wiped out by Maximian for their descent. Religious persecution was nothing new by the time of the Roman Empire. Conquerors had been attempting to destroy religions for eons before the Romans, and several millennia later, it's still happening. Rarely, however, does a civilization actually succeed in purging a religion from their territory. Enter the Roman Empire. In 57 AD, the conquest of Britain was in full swing. Rome's armies were struggling to fight back against a guerrilla campaign waged by tribes in the western regions of Wales. Unlike the Romans who are organized, you've got these painted naked warriors. Frustrated by his defeats, the Roman general Suetonius Paulinus took his legions from the Roman city of Chester to the island of Mona, today known as Anglesey. Mona was the spiritual home of the Britannic Druidic religion and the literal home of the religion's leaders and native people. According to writer and broadcaster Phil Carides, Many, if not most, of the Druids actually lived there and were certainly on the island when Suetonius attacked. A massacre followed. Men, women, and children were killed and their bodies burned on makeshift pyres. The Druids' sacred groves were burned, their altars smashed, and their temples sacked. In one swift blow, Suetonius sounded the death knell for the Welsh resistance and deprived an entire culture of its religious spirit. The few survivors fled to Ireland and the Druidic religion was driven underground and is never recovered. It may not surprise you to learn that Rome's attempts to destroy another religion, Christianity, weren't quite as successful as their efforts against Druidism, but you can be assured they gave it a go. Nero was the first Roman leader to persecute Christians. He publicly blamed them for the Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD. In reality, Nero was trying to deflect rumors that he himself had been responsible for the blaze. His actions after the blaze were just as incriminating. Nero confiscated a third of the charred city as his own personal property. According to Tacitus, he would have Christians dressed in animal skins and torn apart by dogs. Under Trajan in the 2nd century AD, Christians survived under a don't ask, don't tell policy enacted by Rome. But it didn't stop other Roman citizens taking matters into their own hands, and Christians often found themselves victims of mob violence. Christians who admitted to their religion freely and refused to repent could receive any number of punishments. Some were beheaded, while others were crucified, burned, or condemned to the beasts. 
Christians. When they see a few of their high priests eaten by lions, they'll turn to our gods. It's from here that the popular image of Christians being fed to the lions in the arena originates. Hundreds of emperors rose to power during the Roman Empire. Many were legitimate, but not all. Some were powerful, some were practically benign, and some were wise, just, and good, as good as an emperor can be, eschewing malice, cruelty, and insanity. There were almost too many examples to list. Among the most significant is Caracalla, who, after hearing that the people of Alexandria were mocking him, rode to the city and began a period of festivities to lure in citizens from the surrounding countryside. He then gathered all the young men in a nearby field, telling them they would form a new honorary phalanx in his army. Unarmed, most of them were cut down by Caracalla's soldiers, the rest were buried alive. You've also got Commodus, of course, who believed he was the reincarnation of Hercules, and frequently entered the arena to fight animals or other gladiators, usually handicapped ones. Have I missed it? Have I missed the battle? You have missed the war. He had a penchant for killing senators and tried to rename Rome after himself. And who could forget Caligula? He's a guy who committed incest with his three sisters, watched executions for enjoyment, and once decreed to his citizenry that he was a living god and that a bridge should be built from the Temple of Jupiter to his palace so he could check in with his fellow deity. He also made it a crime punishable by death for anyone to even look at his bald spot. Rome had some real characters. The arena was a vital part of the Roman Empire's cultural identity and useful when emperors needed to pacify their subjects. Not all arena events were violent, but plenty of them were bloody as all get out. Chief among these were the gladiatorial games. Gladiators were usually slaves or prisoners of war, although freeborn volunteers occasionally took part for the money they receive upon swearing the gladiatorial oath. In addition, some emperors forced upper-class Roman citizens to fight in the arena. The games themselves range from bouts between individual gladiators to recreations of entire battles, both land and sea, which might feature thousands of participants, chariots, horses, or ships as part of the spectacle. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Aside from all this, arenas also form the backdrop for the killing of exotic animals, the execution of prisoners, and other such atrocities, or as Romans called it, entertainment. It's not often in a dictatorship that power is taken away from the dictator and given back to the people. More often, power might be transferred from the dictator to another dictator. In the latter days of the Roman Empire, however, the reins were actually handed over to the dictator's bodyguards. Rome is to be a republic again. The Praetorians had been founded in the days of the Roman Republic to serve as an escort for high-ranking soldiers and politicians. Augustus, the first emperor, established a newer, larger unit known as the Praetorian Guard permanent bodyguard of 4,500 men whose sole purpose was to protect the emperor and his family. By the later stages of the empire, this unit consisted of over 10,000 men. Members of the Praetorian Guard were exempt from taxes, provided with superior equipment, awarded higher pay, and were often given gifts by the emperors they protected. As the power of the throne waned, the Praetorians began to wield more and more political influence. Emperors were forced to appease them with gifts if they wanted to maintain control. The guard killed Pertinax in 193 AD for not paying them enough, then offered the throne to anybody who could afford it. Emperor Caracalla even ended up killed by a Praetorian officer named Macrinus, who was then proclaimed emperor himself. Few in Rome commanded as much strength as a Praetorian guard, and as a result of their efforts, the empire was ruled for extended periods of time by what was little more than a military junta. The fall of Rome was rapid, violent, and cataclysmic. The plunder economy was ultimately unsustainable. The business of motivating men to fight is a tricky matter, Posca. Once the empire ceased making new conquests and invaders from beyond their borders began to pick off colonies, Rome's financial coffers were quickly depleted, and the state was plunged into economic depression. The costs on Roman society were incalculable, and the bill had to be paid. Meanwhile, infighting between aspiring emperors and other political players began to tear the empire apart from within. Finally, aggressive migration into Rome's territories caused a total collapse of the state by, in effect, destroying the empire's tax base. Many imperial regions fell to pieces entirely. Britain and northern Gaul in particular took the brunt of the empire's destruction, as population numbers dropped, especially among peasants. Across Europe, military power shifted into the hands of elite landowners who had the means and motivation to take advantage of the chaos. The Pax Romana was now nothing more than a distant memory. As before, war was the method by which the wealthy could secure power. From this charred, barren landscape sprang the warlords, the aristocrats, and the successor kings the new breeds of rulers who would dominate Europe for the next thousand years. 